Hello? Uh, are you starting? <laughs> Hello, 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 everybody. Hi, welcome to the Design for America Spark Series. This is our fall kickoff. Um, my name is Liz Gerber. I am the faculty founder of Design for America and a professor at Northwestern University. And one of my favorite things about being a designer is the opportunity to talk to fabulous people. And we will not disappoint you today. Um, we have the bright, thoughtful, creative designer, Dr. Leslie Ann Noel. Um, and my hope is we're going to talk about uh, human-centered design in the day and day and age that we are in. And my hope is that this conversation really um, makes you rethink your practice as it, as it has um, made me think, rethink my practice. So Without further ado, um, we're gonna get started. We're gonna have a conversation with Leslie for about 30 minutes or so. I encourage you to put your questions in the chat box. Um, also, please tell us where you're calling in from. It's always interesting to hear. Um, put your questions in the chat box and we'll aim to get to as many as we can. Um, we're gonna start warming up uh, by hearing from Leslie because she has such a fascinating background um, that I'm going to start uh, the conversation, Leslie, with you and ask you the very broad question and not an easy question to answer for you. Tell me about yourself. Yes, um, so we don't have a, enough time <laughs> to go there um, because I've, um, I've lived in different places. So you could say like I've had different lives and, and each of these different lives has been very exciting. So um, to not take up the entire time, I'll, I'll do a little bit of a summary version. So I'm from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean and spent, um, grew up there. I've, I've spent most of my life in Trinidad, but I, um, I've, I often leave and then go back. So I did um, undergrad in Brazil. Um, I studied industrial design in Brazil. And even how I got to Brazil is a kind of interesting story because my parents, um, wanted me to study in Trinidad and I didn't want to study at all in Trinidad. And then they said something like, well, you can study anywhere in the world if we don't have to pay for it. And um, that, that was an exciting challenge for me as an 18 year old because I was then on this mission of finding free education. And I applied to scholarships in Nigeria, in Germany, in France, and, and then ended up um, getting um, a scholarship, we could say it wasn't quite a scholarship, but I ended up with the ability or the access to education in Brazil. And so I ended up in Brazil. Um, I lived first in Salvador, Bahia. And then I lived in Curitiba, which at one point was the design capital of, you know, one of those world design cities. Um, so it was a really good place for me to be doing industrial design. Uh, and then I went back to Trinidad and then I left again. I lived in Uganda for a bit, um, worked in Kenya and Tanzania in East Africa. So I had a, a little East Africa period, went back to Trinidad again. Um, went to North Carolina where I did a PhD in design, lived for a year in California, <laughs> and I'm now currently in um, New Orleans, Louisiana. So, I mean, that, that doesn't really tell you about me, but it tells you about all of these different places that I have geographic connections to. And I guess what that would tell you though about me is that I'm not afraid of adventure. <laughs> you know, I'm just kind of, um, I'm very excited about life and people and um, new places. And uh, um, that has been a, a through line throughout my career that I will go where the, um, where the interesting opportunities are. Thank you, Leslie. I wish I could go with you to all those places. It sounds <laughs> lovely. Um, to get to the question of the hour, given all the different places you come from and you've experienced, um, we're asking you, we're asking many folks this fall to ask about how they're centering around design education this fall in particular, given all your, your different experiences. How are you centering around design education? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to switch the, um, the first word. I'm trying to remember what part of speech it is. I don't remember right now, but I'm going to switch the asking word to the what, you know. So okay. what am I centering? Mm -hmm. um, but my big picture, my big what is I am keeping myself accountable to 
people of color and to people who might be um, traditionally excluded from design okay. where, um, you know, so I'm, I'm working on a project right now where my students are, um, we're working on a project that started in the community where two members of the New Orleans community reached out to me. I mean, we already had a fairly familiar relationship and they just emailed me and said, well, here's what we want you to be working on. <laughs> and I said, okay, that's what I want to hear. And um, we're checking in then, you know, I'm checking in with the women who reached out to me and the class is checking in with them on a regular basis. And even when I'm not checking with, it, with them, I'm asking myself, okay, are we focusing on them or are we focusing on us as an institution? And, you know, and, and sometimes I will realize that actually I'm focusing more on something else and then because I'm doing it in a very conscious way, I'll make the pivot and, and come back to what I've, I've considered as very important um, this semester. And so, then um, I know you're gonna ask me a question. I'm gonna um, ask for specifics because I wanna know, that's a great abstract um, explanation, but what does that actually look like? What does it mean to come back to, to them? So, you know, like, so when we teach, um, we are we're actually focused on really abstract aims, you know, like we want, um, in my case, I teach students who are not designers. Mm -hmm. And one of the abstract aims is I want my students to understand things like exploring creativity and um, experimentation and things like that. And actually, um, on, an, on that kind of pedagogical level, I am sometimes less focused on the actual outcome because I'm more focused on the process, right? But if I am trying to keep myself accountable, I have to really be asking these questions. Okay, the range of solutions that these students have created, how are these solutions actually related to the initial concerns that the community members gave us? Or how are they really related to anything that we heard in the interviews that we did? And it's, it's so it's um, my tangible experience is that I am, um, I'm trying to create, I'm gonna borrow somebody else's um, term, a colleague of mine in Australia. Um, I'm trying to create more touch points between uh, my students and our partners and as well as me, you know, with me and the partners, you know, because I could, as the professor, have a little bit more of a distance. Um, I could create some more distance, but I've tried to not create the distance and, and I've tried to actually get much closer um, this semester. There's another how, I, I'll tell you what the other how is. I have some notes, so I'm kind of looking at the notes every now and again, and I could be off um, the notes. Um, but another how that I've been very interested in this semester, or, or not another how, another what, is um, I've been very interested in seeing how I can bring in um, multiple perspectives um, into the design class. So, um, you know, the, as I talked about non-mainstream, people who are sometimes excluded from design, I'm also thinking of other designers who may be in, excluded from conversations or, or other design professors. Um, so yesterday in my class, we had the critique and my friend who's a professor in Barbados, she came um, to the class and she participated in the critique. Um, and, you know, we talked about that for, for quite a bit afterwards where she said, you know, I actually haven't been to a critique like this in, in more than 10 years. And, you know, um, just because of your geographic location, you become excluded from conversations, you know, and now is a time when we don't have to be so excluded. So I've been very conscious about bringing in um, very international perspectives into my design class. Um, we have a series of recordings um, at Tulane where we got people, um, researchers from all around the world. Um, we, so we, it, it's, I know Alden will share this link at some stage, but the pivot, um, and we'll talk about it a few times again, the pivot um, research, it was a conference that we did earlier this year. There is a series of videos on our website at Tulane 
where those have been coming into class a little bit. And then we also have some interviews that are not available yet <laughs> on our website, where last year we had students interview designers all around the world. And every class, at the end of every class this semester, my students have to listen to these interviews. And again, it's it's perspectives from people who are not um, who are not from what might be considered mainstream design culture. So like um, they interviewed a design professor in Jamaica, they've interviewed a design professor in Puerto Rico, uh, not they've interviewed, sorry, this semester, they're listening to the interviews. Last year we did the interviews, but this semester my students have had to listen to these interviews from all over the world. And then afterwards, um, I don't think any of them in the room, so they, they, they're not going to get the spoiler. <laughs> but after the end of the semester, they have to talk about their own design process and then kind of something that they heard with, um, you know, what was, what was the connecting point maybe between their own design process and something that they heard from, from these people who are designers all around the world. Because very often we only focus on like, very very famous designers and you know there's some certain names i'm not going to call any of them but you know there maybe we could say oh this is what this famous designer does but you know not um design isn't only limited to famous designers you know it's a process that a lot of other people um use and so we're trying to do that um I'm trying to do that in the centering this semester. This is a wonderful idea. Are there any particular interviews that stand out to you? Anything that you learned in the interview that surprised you or intrigued you? There is so much, you know, like I listened to all of these interviews last year. Um, and then this year, my students have had to, um, well, I have to read the interviews again um, oh, I have to listen to the interviews again while they work this year. And um, there was an interview by a designer in Brazil that I thought was really interesting where she talked about, um, she really talked about her positionality, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I, I missed it when I heard it first, but she, she came to the interview and she said, look, I am a white woman in Brazil with blonde hair and, you know, and she really, really described herself very clearly. And she said, look, I am using my position as a white Brazilian designer to do X, Y, Z. And, and the X, Y, Z was to be able to open space um, and create space to, um, for her to understand the perspectives of people in the community and make sure that their, their perspectives are really heard, okay? She is in um, civic design. Actually, her name is Giselle, which is like Giselle, Giselle Rowlick Murphy. And um, I, I just, I really appreciated in these interviews how all of these designers leaned into their identities. Mm -hmm. um, which we asked them, you know, we asked them questions about their identities, but they really, really leaned into them. And um, I think that that's, that was one of the things that, that really stood out to me in these interviews. And then I also liked how the different designers talked about, um, they <coughs> just made design very accessible, you know, so it was great to hear, um, like, I, I don't remember them specifically, but I know one designer, Michael Lepoy, who is a friend of mine, you know, because really what the interviews were about was just me asking different friends or people who I knew if they would consent to be to being interviewed. And so Michael, I think Michael had talked about design in a very accessible way, maybe around carnival or, um, you know, so it's, that's, and these interviews will become public actually. So people can can hang on and 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 wait, but we're creating like a, a little podcast um, at Tulane where students are listening to the interviews and actually commenting on them. And um, that should be released like before the end of the semester. Um, so other people will be able to hear, but I just liked how, again, some of the, the, these designers moved design away from a very academic space or like a very theoretical space and brought it into ordinary practice. Um, you know, and then we asked them about the tension between design and design thinking, and it was always interesting to hear their perspectives. You know, some of them are 
pro-design thinking and some of them are anti-design thinking, but you know, those, pers those perspectives are always interesting. Wait, may I ask you where you are? So I'm in a complicated space <laughs> <laughs> where Even more I've, interesting. <laughs> I've, I've figured out how to talk about design thinking mm -hmm. in a way that I think does not alienate designers or people who are um, more solidly in the design thinking camp, right? Where I, I talk about it around food, you know, and you'll actually see in a lot of the work that we're doing this year at Tulane, we have a, a really solid food theme running and everything. Like we have a, one thing called design thinking breakfast and another thing is design thinking gumbo. And, and so I talk about design thinking like curry, where, um, so in Trinidad, we eat lots and lots of curry, right? And I say that, you know, some people learn to master ingredients so that they do not need um, recipes anymore. Mm -hmm. And and some people still need the, the recipe. So when you are starting off in, in, in work, um, in cooking, you're gonna follow a recipe very closely. And I talk about design thinking a little bit like that where oh. people are learning and the recipe can be useful, right? We might think that there are issues with the recipe, um, but we might follow it. Or it, as we get more confident, we'll, we'll actually throw away the recipe. And then um, I, I, and I literally say this in, in some of the classes where I'm asking students, okay, get comfortable with the ingredients. And that in, those ingredients are related to doing community work, um, being able to see patterns, um, being able to be creative and experimental and things like that. So start off with that, with the recipe, um, with the ingredients, and then eventually learn to cook for, um, learn to cook for different kinds of contexts, right? Because you might have a friend who's allergic, and again, the curry thing, you might have someone who's allergic to ginger or to coconut milk or whatnot, and you take out these recipes, um, these ingredients. And so that's my idea that, um, learning the ingredients of a good of good design work that's important and then knowing how to combine these ingredients and making them relevant to the context or even to be able to recognize that there are ingredients that are missing and then we need to add some others so mm -hmm. that's yeah that's what i i talk about um, wonderful. Um, Alden asked a few questions. People are enjoying the cooking analogy. Um, <laughs> Alden asked, and I am too, it's also making me hungry, but um, <laughs> my question is, or Alden's question, which I like is by throwing away the recipe, does this allow for more spontaneity and creativity? And then there's another question I'm going to ask because I think it's related, um, which is how do you think about expanding multiple perspectives about what is possible in the classroom? And I think both these questions are really about creativity. What, what is possible and how do you use the tools of design to figure out what is possible and what perspectives are missing? Oh my goodness. Now I have two questions. I don't know what to answer. Oh, <laughs> so, okay. All this question, question <laughs> about throwing away the recipe. So, to me, throwing away the recipe is very important um, because when I first started to interact with design thinking people, <laughs> I say that and I laugh um, because I've, I've been a designer for more than 20 years. So it means that I did design before people were, were talking about design thinking like that, you know, and um, like some of my first few interactions with, again, design thinking people, people would say to me, okay, and now we're at this part, you know, and, or, or we skipped that, that step and we were supposed to do that step. And, you know, as a designer, I really was kind of like shocked and surprised that we would be in this kind of mode of, of checking boxes like that. When really, I think that the, um, the design process is emergent. You know, I mean, we know what the vague process might be, but it's, it, you know, we are going to use emergent strategy as we work in design. And, and therefore, um, if we are only trying to follow a recipe, mm -hmm. 
then we miss some opportunities, you know? And so I think that um, flexibility and creativity and, you know, these are skills that we really have to have then as designers, you know? And I, I, I use the general term designers, even when I'm teaching people who are not designers, because my students are, um, my students are generally actually not designers. And so, you know, they sometimes ask, well, are we designers or design thinkers? And I say, well, okay, I'm actually going to just call you designer. Right, I'm not gonna separate it like that. Okay, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. So maybe returning to the question that um, there's so many great resources being put in the chat. So please do check those out as, as we're talking. Um, one, of the, one of the questions that Alden asked was how do you bring in diverse perspectives? And I think this might be an opportunity to share with the group the incredible work you're doing with the Design Research Society around the plural versal um, design. Would you mind sharing a bit about what that effort's about and what kind of questions you're asking and what you're learning? Yeah. Okay, um, so that's a big, <laughs> uh, so yes, I'm going to tell you more about that. So I'm the co-chair of, um, of a group called the Pluriversal Design Special Interest Group um, of the Design Research Society. And the aim of that group is really about bringing in um, multiple perspectives. Um, and, and I'll go even beyond that and probably bring in language that I'll, that I'll end up tying myself on, but also bringing in multiple epistemologies and ontologies um, in design, you know, and into design conversations, you know, and we borrow um, shamelessly the title of Azur, um, Arturo Escobar's book, Designs for the Pluriverse. Um, the, this, the group is named after that book, and that book is very, very cited um, right now in design among people who are talking about diverse perspectives in design. And so in that group, we're really very focused on um, designers who are not taking the perspective of Europe and North America. Um, they might be situated in Europe and North America, but they're, they're very interested in design or design practice outside of Europe and no North America. Um, and because then that's the main focus um, of the group of bringing in these multiple perspectives, it means that we're really intentionally um, going to like making contacts with designers in India, you know, so we actually have quite a few people from the National Institute of Design in um, Bangalore and Ahmedabad who we're in conversation with regularly. Um, we have conversations with a lot of people in Brazil as well, you know, where we're trying to figure out, okay, how are people doing design in other places? How are they thinking about design in other places? Um, what are other worldviews that affect the way that we practice design? You know, like, so as a designer from Trinidad, is the way that I practice design um, different to a designer who's um, from somewhere in the US? Or even, okay, I'm in New Orleans right now. How does that affect the way that we we um, we practice design and so our conversations are um, are a, a lot about that so what do you, I, I want to I'd love to hear the answer to your question is how, how does your experience in Trinidad influence the way you practice design I think it does influence the way that I practice design because we um, we talk about identity mm -hmm. um, in a very different way in Trinidad. Um, Trinidad is a very multi-ethnic place. And, um, and so it means, you know, we're, we're multi-ethnic and almost on a policy level, you know, and sometimes it's like over the top where um, maybe the way that, that Canada also talks about, um, you know, in, uh, Canada has policies around ethnicities or, you know, you, people talk about ethnicity in a different way in Canada and, you know, Trinidad and some other places, it's a little bit like that. So like in Trinidad, I'm probably not going to have any issue with me going into a room and saying, well, okay, I'm a black woman, blah, 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 blah. And this is the way I think, you know, whereas um, I think that people in the US sometimes need maybe a little bit more coaching to talk about identity um, 
in in a way that doesn't make them feel uncomfortable you know like so um if we go back to the interviews that my students were listening to when we listened or when they listened um for grades so i'll say they listen when they listened to the interview by giselle i was really struck by um how many of them because they, they have a a, a question that they have to respond to where they talk about the person's identity and how many of them glossed over in their comments that she was a white woman in a brown country or something like that and and I said but she said that why would you not even put that in the answer because this is not even you thinking about it you making an, an assumption the person actually said it um and they didn't, they didn't want to refer to it. And I think it's because of that comfort level. So to go back to the original question, I think that being an outsider, being a Trinidadian, be, you know, probably makes me um, think about race and identity in a different way. And probably um, when I used to teach in Trinidad, I used to really ask students to lean into their identity in the work that they were doing. And I, I've continued to do that. I've continued to try to do that. I'm not always successful, but I've continued to try to do that in the work that I do here. Um, the other thing that might be different is that I think, and now remember, I am an outsider now. You know, we have these, we're always moving between insider and outsider perspectives. So I've been in the US for five years, even though I go to Trinidad often, which I can't right now. Um, right. So my, my perspective is, is <clears throat> could be a little bit nostalgic. You know, if there's someone from Trinidad in the room, they might say, oh, this woman is making up all of this stuff, right? Oh. But um, I think that one other thing is that relationships, um, in Trinidad and in Latin America. So the, the places that I've spent a lot of time are Trinidad and Brazil and in South America, you know, and relationships between people are different. Mm. Um, and I think that we bring that relationship, um, relationality mm -hmm. <laughs> into the work that we do. And I probably do also bring that into the work that I do um, here in the US. Hmm. So that's another way that it, it might affect um, or impact the way that I work. Interesting. I want to push on the re uh, this idea about relationship, the way we relate to each other. And does it also apply to the way we relate to objects and interactions? So much of our of what we're designing now are products and interactions. I'm curious if you think it also influences. That. I think it would influence um, I, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about an example that I heard in a meeting. Um, I heard a designer talk about how she had lived in Japan mm -hmm. and she studied, I mean, maybe people in the room know who she is. Um, she studied objects or no, not, she, she studied robots and, and that interaction then between people and and these robots. Sure. And she said that um, robots in Japan are polite. <laughs> um, and so th that's a way that we could see the, the um, identity of a place influencing the, the things that people design, you know? And, and she didn't mean that robots in, in America were not polite, but, you know, robots in America are focused on a different um, element of the interaction. Whereas robots in Japan have to have to be designed in a way that respects the context that they're in. And so they, the, the robots have a level of politeness that we don't see in other parts of the world. Now, I've never been to Japan, but I just that anecdote stuck with me for quite a while, as you see. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you recently create, well, maybe not recently, but in the last couple of years, created a really interesting tool called the Designer's Critical Alphabet. I believe it's called. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell people what that's about and what inspired that beautiful design and how it's being used. Oh, thank you. Oh, wow. I see it. Oh, demo. my goodness. <laughs> you that? I was hoping to have mine ready, but I didn't. I was going to say, I never leave home without it, but also I like literally never leave home these days. So I just. Can you, can you put it up again one more time or just show us a sense of what's in the cards? You can be our, 
or Vanna White, thank you. Oh, that's cool because I don't even have one on my desk. Um, so, so oh, Jessica has hers too. Yes. Oh, Jessica, and I see. So, oh my goodness, I'm seeing quite a few. So, like in my window, I see four in a row. Okay, <laughs> so why? Very you, interesting. Why'd you do it? They're clearly a hit. What What inspired it? So I'm really surprised at how popular they've been. So thank you um, to everyone. Um, <laughs> And the what inspired it, it's, there are a few levels of the what, right? So um, one thing is that I was new to teaching in the US. So I, I, I went to Stanford for a year after I did my PhD. And I was walking around the room, which I normally do as a design, um, design instructor, walking around the room, listening to conversations with students. And, but actually there, there are like two anecdotes I wanna give here. So the first one is actually less um, nice and fuzzy. It, it's one that really, really affected me, right? We gave the students the opportunity to choose who they wanted to design for, right? And, and this is something that I would normally do in a design class, you know, and ask students, okay, well, who's your target market? And you focus on, you know, and, um, who you, Who's the user that you're going to focus your conversations around? And when the students came back um, and shared who they chose to design around, all six groups chose a version of a white male, mm. right? So maybe a, a white boy, an older man. Um, I, and I think maybe three groups had chosen like kind of tech bro, um, young 20 something and now i they i don't really have a problem with where they wanted to focus but the fact that all six groups chose that focus i said okay we need to do something about this you know i went back to the teaching team that i was working with and i said something has to change tomorrow you know how are we going to get these people to pivot their design so that they are focusing on people with more needs, no offense to white males in the group, right? Um, but, you know, I really want students to focus more on, on people with more problems, you know? And, and, you know, Liz, we've had this conversation. I do also have a tension with focusing on problems, you know, and I, for me, that's a little bit problematic. <laughs> Sorry to use the word again, but I think that we have to be thinking about how are we making life better for mm -hmm people who are very affected. So that was the first thing I was trying to think, okay, so how are we gonna get people to move? And so I started to think about all of these perspectives and that's when cards like feminist theory and critical race theory started to be built. Then um, the other thing now is me then as this black woman in the room with all of these Stanford students, you know, feeling a little bit um, tense about going in and giving these students feedback on their designs. And I thought, well, I have to devise a way of giving feedback in a way that doesn't, um, that, that is a little non-confrontational, you know? I'm a little bit of an avoider sometimes, right? So really? I can be. <laughs> <laughs> so I was trying to avoid conflict, but actually give the feedback that I wanted to give, you know? And so, so I'm, I am, non-confrontational and I want to call things out that I see you know as an outsider I see things that that don't work right so I would go it I would walk around the room and I would just kind of drop a card on the table and say well okay you need to change here's what I want you to think about now you know and and that's why it, it became a deck in that kind of way because it started to allow me to to bring in additional perspectives Mm -hmm. without me kind of having to stand up and say, you know, that your, that your design is whatever, whatever, whatever. It's sexist. It's racist. It, and, and I mean, it wasn't any of those things, but it was, it was me trying to figure out how can I do this, um, give this feedback in a space where I still was very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, yeah, so, so that's where the, the deck came out of. There are a couple of other things, but it was really then me, um, you know, I, I studied um, at NC State. I see an, at least one NC State person in the room. So hi, <laughs> right? And I was thinking of, um, so I studied 
design, um, you know, in the PhD, I learned about different perspectives and I chose to do design through an emancipatory perspective and I chose um, critical theory. And so the cards developed because I was trying to figure out how to bring critical theory or how to bring other perspectives into the design process. Mm -hmm. And how do I bring those conversations into the room, even if I'm a little bit uncomfortable um, in asking people to talk about them? Bravo. Clearly, they've been a hit. They um, have been. <laughs> and we look forward to what is next. I'm sure there'll be another, um, another one. Um, I want to take the last few minutes of our time here um, to ask you what excites you most. And before you, before you answer this question, or what's on top of mind, like if you could just talk endlessly about a topic, something you're working on, I'd love to hear what's, what's right there. Um, before we get there, I'm going to ask the, the audience who's been listening in um, at the end of this, after um, Dr. Noel has answered this question, I'm going to ask you as a gift to her for everybody to put something in the chat um, at the end when I ask um, about something they learned or something they're taking away so she can have the perspective of um, this wonderful Brady Bunch group that we have here of images. So don't put it in yet, but I just want you to be thinking, what is something that you will walk, you will walk away with um, from this talk? So Dr. Noel has a sense of what resonated or not. So back to you, Dr. Noel, what excites you most? What are you just, what do you want to run and do right after this, this talk? What do I want to run and do right after this talk? What project are you working on that excites you most right okay, now? Okay, so yeah, I, I can't think about that. I am working with a team of student um, fellows and we are trying to figure out how to make different, a, a wide range of um, design research methods available to um, a big audience, you know, because, okay, so when we think about design thinking, we all think about post-its and post-its are great. Um, <laughs> now 3M has to pay me for saying that. But, <laughs> but you know, there, there are other ways of doing um, research. There are other ways of doing ethnographic research. And so we are creating this series called Design Thinking Gumbo, where we are introducing um, different research methods to people and we're showing people how they can use them remotely. Uh, so like literally at the end of this meeting, I'm going to run and meet one of my graduate assistants and we're going to work on um, her research method, which is cultural pr probes, right? Um, so it, that has been exciting for me because I, I mean, I suggested some research methods for them, but then they were able to lean in and talk about, okay, what they were interested in. And then we co-designed um, ways that we could make this available to the public, right? And then, so another thing that is also interesting tied to that, my, my projects are all tied in different ways. Um, so connected to that project, I'm working with someone in public health, Dr. Alessandra Bassano, where we are studying how to help people in public health understand what um, the public is interested in, um, what the public thinks is, is most important in research. So we're, we're actually using what the graduate assistants build and then we're taking it to a group of New Orleans residents and we're like showing them, we're trying out some of these tools with them. And then we're going to kind of coach some public health practitioners to do these projects, these little experiments with um, residents of New Orleans. We're trying to understand what has people's experience of the pandemic been and how have people had to change their behavior. And that, now this is getting big. And, and then based on all of that, we are going to, um, well, support them to go to like the public health, like Louisiana Public Health Institute and say, well, okay, residents are interested in studying child care because this is an issue because of COVID or, you know, so we've taken then this really um, more academic and theoretical space of what is a research method and then try to turn it into um, how can people use this in public health. So these are things that I'm excited about. And I'm just excited about collaboration in general. So, you know, excited to work with this person in public health, um, excited to work with somebody else in math and yeah, lots of collaborations. That's, that's what makes me excited. 
I love it. And somebody remarked design thinking gumbo is a popular name. I'm going to encourage you to, is there a school of cooking at Tulane? I think you have a, your future somewhere is design and cuisine. Um, <laughs> that would be fun to see what comes about. Um, so at this point, I'm going to encourage everybody um, to write just to take away their, um, that they're going to walk away with. Um, as an example, I think the one I'm going to walk away with after listening to Dr. Mello's talk was this idea of relationships and how the, um, the culture in which which we developed our understanding of relationships really influences how we design. So thank you, Dr. Noel, for, um, for offering that perspective. Um, while people are writing those final comments, I'm wondering, and you'll get a chance, we can send them to you later. I'm wondering, Dr. Noel, if you have any final thoughts in the last minute, any, any recommendations or thoughts of, of this time on uh, what it means to be a designer in fall of 2020? Goodness, fall of 2020. <laughs> All, all I can do is laugh. Ah, um, yes, the response. <laughs> yes. Maybe that's the perfect response. That's the perfect response. I think just um, be experimental and, and be actually comforted by the fact that we don't have to remain in the spaces that we're in um, because everyone is flying around the world via Zoom. <laughs> you know, there was a day that was pretty interesting where my day started in the UK and it ended in Australia. And I mean, yeah. I was in New Orleans in the middle, but you know, just just lean into that, take advantage of that. Um, LinkedIn right now, again, LinkedIn should pay me for this, is an <laughs> incredible place. You know, I have connected with so many new people and had new conversations with people. So I mean, yeah. that's the thing to take out of this moment, mm -hmm. that there are no borders right now, or borders are closed and no boundaries, but we can have these conversations even um, across, um, this distance that we have. Well, Dr. Al, thank you so much. This has been a highlight of my day, certainly, and I'm sure many others in the audience. Thank you so much for taking your precious time um, to spend some time in Chicago. I'm not even sure where, where we are right now, but um, <laughs> thank you so much for spending this time. Um, let's give a round of applause. Um, for Dr. Rell. And with that, I'll turn it over to our um, amazing Alden Burke, who will tell us about the next Spark series. Alden. Thanks, Liz, and thanks, Leslie. Uh, this is an excellent way to kick off the Spark series. Um, two things I want to share with you all before you hop off uh, into your next calls, inevitably. The first thing uh, new we're doing for the Spark series this season is we've created a running resource list. Um, I've just chatted it uh, in the Zoom chat here, and to really document. I, we have an incredible amount of speakers who come in and there are so many resources and readings and things that are shared in these calls that this is a way for us to, yeah, document and hold them, right? So feel free to go in there and add anything that was missed. There's also a tab on the bottom um, that you are welcome and we encourage you to include your information in, right? The folks in these calls are really amazing and brilliant people. And so if you wanna be connected to them further outside of these calls, feel free to share your information, connect on LinkedIn. I've seen other webinars do it, it's been really successful. Um, so something fun. And then, uh, yeah, this was the first of our six series fall spark sessions next week. Uh, I'm chatting it also in the Zoom chat. Uh, we have partnered with Civilization, which is a de design firm out in Seattle. We've worked with them a few times. I'm sure some of you in this call know them. They're fantastic. Um, we're having Christian Carter, who is actually from Chicago. She lives not far from me. Um, she does a lot of work around uh, buttons, pin back buttons, and thinking about the power of buttons in terms of activism, accessibility, visual design. So she has just came out with a book looking at the history, 125 years of the buttons, um, and going to also be relating that conversation to protest movements and visuals that we're seeing um, today. So I think it's going to be a really great talk. She'll be joining us uh, next Wednesday at 1 p.m. We have a, another great handful of speakers as well. So we're excited that you all joined us on this first call. We hope to see you back. Thank you again, Leslie, for all of the wisdom. And I'm just, I love the, I'm really gonna be thinking about like, yeah, design and cooking and recipes and like, yeah, what does it mean to trust myself, right? And throw out that recipe and see what happens and emerges because of that. So thanks all. I'll leave this open for a minute or two so you can go back, reference any links, um, but we'll send the recording to you all in a follow-up and Otherwise, have a great Wednesday and we hope to see you soon.